Welcome, everyone. This is Robin Duncan. I am here with my husband, Terry Macy. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you. This is our A Course in Miracles Global Study Group, and today we are on our sixth class for Chapter 20, and we will cover Section 7. It is called The Consistency of Means and End. Let's start with an opening prayer. Take in a nice, deep, relaxing breath. And dear God, today we call upon your perfect wisdom, your clarity, your peace, and your reassurance that we are all safe and secure and that your plan for our happiness is intact, it is stable, and there is nothing to fear. We are learning to see through and beyond appearances for what you created within us is eternal spirit, one with you, free of all limits. There is not one part of us that has been darkened. There is not one part of us that is without the joy and the happiness that you have blessed us with. If we have the experience of not being so happy or joyful, it just means that there's more for us to remember, more about what God created within us instead of the images that we have made. The Holy Spirit is a perfect guide, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, as you guide us each day and remind us of who we really and truly are so that we can know the great happiness that is the will of God. We receive that blessing together, and we celebrate it together. Amen. Our topic today is about the consistency of means and end. And you will learn that once you have set your goal of peace, that it is the Holy Spirit that will supply the means to get you there. Let's say you're going through something very challenging and there's so many twists and turns and ways that things could go wrong or right, <laughs> but maybe you don't know which way to go, which way to turn. Keep your goal of peace instead of trying to fix this or that or decide this or that. Set your goal of peace very directly. Invite the Holy Spirit to accomplish the means to meet the goal. When you set your goal of peace, you are aligning with God's plan for you. So now we're no longer out of alignment with God's will. And that's why it's so important to set your goal of peace and then allow the Holy Spirit to supply you with whatever is needed to meet the goal of peace. It is important to remember that your true identity is that you are the holy child of God. You are not a body. You are eternal spirit. You are not separated. You are one with God and one with each other. You are not limited, controlled, enslaved, or restricted. You are free of all limits. You are not at risk or in danger. You are safe and healed and blessed and whole. And what God created within you cannot be undone. What God created within you is perfect, and it will be forever, for all of eternity. And our ego is the part of our mind that we are allowing to preoccupy us it is a part of our mind where we have accepted that we could be something other than what God created. What God created is perfect in every way, absolutely perfect. And then this part of our mind called the ego says that what God created as perfect can be made imperfect. So now if you look in the mirror or you see yourself as a separated body, you might notice all the flaws and the imperfections and you might think that that's just a, a normal day or a normal way of thinking. 
But underneath that, we want to understand that that is our ego's attempt to usurp the power of God. That means to take it over, to have dominion. And so the ego has no power over God. But every time we see ourselves or someone else as a body or less than perfect, flawed, deceptive, dishonest, addicted, all of those things that we have seen before, if we claim that that is their true identity, then we let go of their true identity. And what happens is that we will feel like we are separated from God. We will end up feeling powerless and alone and without direction. It's not because we are. It's because in A Course in Miracles, it says that when we engage illusions, we forfeit our awareness of what is real and true. So every time we see someone that we are tempted to judge as a body, as their personality, their behaviors, what they do wrong, what they didn't say right, and these kinds of things, what we're doing is we are engaging the ego part of our mind instead of the power and the wisdom and the clarity of God in our mind. Remember, you cannot do both at the same time. The Course makes this very clear again and again. When we listen to the voice of the ego and we cast our judgments against others or even ourselves, then what we're doing is we are disengaging from our true identity. And you might think, well, okay, maybe I do that. What's the big deal? What well, is a big deal? It's a big deal because if we hold on to those judgments and we cast those judgments on these other people or even on ourselves, what we're saying underneath that judgment is this person over here, they are not the holy, perfect, precious, blessed, light-filled, eternal child of God. They are not that. The bigger problem is when we cast that judgment because separation is not real, then we must include ourselves in that assessment. And then the problem about that, it's kind of like a rolling stone that just kind of keeps rolling downhill. It's not a good thing because if we judge that person as less than whole, which means that they really shouldn't have the divine blessings and inheritance of our all-powerful, infinite creator, that they should not have that. Well, because we're not separate, now I'm saying I should not have that. And so now I'm going to have the experience of my own divine blessings, providence, supply. It will feel as though I've been cut off. And I may not even make that correlation between the judgment I cast against this other person and my own self. There is no separation. So tonight as we look at what he's sharing with us, he's reminding us again, you are not a body. The people that you see that look like they are bodies, this is called projection. And I know it's so hard to understand sometimes because we look at our people and they look as real as they can be. And I accept that I am a figure in your dream and you are a figure in mine. And that's okay. I think if we can just breathe that in, it sounds preposterous maybe, but we do have the capacity, even as we go to sleep tonight, we have the capacity to dream that other people are right there and they look so real. And they're doing all these different things and some things we might like and some things we don't. And we don't even know we are dreaming until we wake up. So right now, A Course in Miracles says, you think you are awake, but not yet. Not quite. And in fact, you woke up from your nighttime dream only to the daytime dream. And it sure looks real and true because the story picks up where the last one left off. It looks so real, but you're not all the way awake. And in fact, these people in your dream, these bodies, they are all showing up the way that you are asking them to. Same thing that we do at night when people show up the way they do. We might have someone that shows up and they're so sweet and nice in our nighttime dream. We might have someone show up and they rob us and take our wallet, right? 
So however these people show up in our nighttime dream, you can imagine that the only one that is assigning those roles is the dreamer. And we are the dreamer. And where do we get all those crazy ideas? Who knows? But we do project them out. And the more that we hold those beliefs and thoughts in our mind, the more we project them out and the more people show up to play those roles we have assigned to them. It's a lot to take in. But as Terry and I have found that simply by allowing ourselves to understand this and then learn how to respond to it differently, it has brought remarkable, miraculous healing into both of our lives. Because when we stop engaging the story we made up, so to speak, in the dream, we stop engaging it, and instead we focus our attention, our thoughts, all of our motivation to whatever God's will is or what the Holy Spirit has to say, listening to only one voice as much as we can, everything changes. It's a game changer. So when you're looking over there in the illusion and you're trying to get somebody to act different, do something different, say something different, or stop doing something or stop saying something, when we're over there kind of fighting the dragon, so to speak, you're going to feel like God has left and God will never leave you. But while you engage what is not real, what is not true, then what is real and true will feel like it's just not in your awareness for the moment. It can change instantly because it's like covering your eyes and all of a sudden there's darkness. It doesn't mean the lights in the room went out. It means that your awareness of the light is now forfeited. So today we're going to talk about the consistency of means and end. And I feel like the bigger points are that we are not a body. And when we see each other as bodies, It means we're declaring separation is real and that we are vulnerable, we are powerless, that this other person is the problem perhaps and that there's nothing we can do to fix that or maybe we try and try and try again and there's still nothing we can do to fix that. So when we engage illusions, remember that the ego's theme is seek but do not find. It's not set up in the illusion for you to actually win or have what you want. This must be known because we can spend countless days and hours trying to get something to change, trying to make something happen, and it just doesn't seem to happen. It doesn't happen in the illusion because it's not supposed to. Illusions fail because they are illusions. You'll have some good moments, some good days, because your ego knows that if everything was awful all the time, it would lose your attention. And so every once in a while, I call it throwing us a bone, kind of like a dog on a bone with no disrespect, but it'll throw us a bone that we'll chew on for a little while until we need another bone. And we tend to put up with that mediocre experience for a very long time. But if it's not happy, it's coming from the ego. And if it's coming from the ego, it's not coming from God. And so there's an opportunity right there to take that relationship or whatever it is that is troubling you, take it straight to God and say, God, set me straight here. Help me to know what is real and true. We are not a body. We cannot be separated that this person that's exhibiting all these qualities that I do not like, this is not the truth of them. I want the truth instead of this. So that's the same thing as setting your goal of peace. We're asking for truth. It's the same thing. They are synonyms. We can ask for the truth. We can ask for peace. We can ask for perfect love. We can ask for total knowledge. All of these lead to the same exact place. So when you're asking God for what is real and true, you are now abandoning in your mind what is unreal and untrue. And in that moment is where the Holy Spirit enters. 
and can now heal your mind, heal those thoughts that have been putting those projections out there, and your eyes will then report the healing to you. And it is miraculous. Let's go ahead, Terry, get started here today with a little laughter. What do you have for us? All right. Well, I have a couple of uh, mini short story jokes for you. Great. The first one is called Healthcare Instructions. So a husband and wife were sitting at home in their living room when the husband suddenly said, Honey, just so you know, I never want to be kept alive in a vegetative state dependent on some machine and fluids flowing into me from a bottle. If that ever happens, just pull the plug. So the wife immediately got up from the living room couch, walked straight over to the TV, pulled the plug on it, and then threw out all of his beer. (laughs) (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Uh, All right, what else? Do you have another one? (laughs) Okay, yeah, one more (laughs) mini for you. (laughs) It's called It's a Strange World. A man bought a new refrigerator for his house. To get rid of his old fridge, he put it in his front yard and hung a sign on it saying, free to a good home. You want it, you take it. For three days, the fridge sat there without even one person looking at it twice. He eventually decided that people were too untrusting of this deal. It looked too good to be true. So he changed the sign to read, fridge for sale, $150. The next day, someone stole it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, our world is so funny, isn't it? The one we made up, right? <laughs> well, on that happy okay. note, <laughs> let's go ahead and start out with Chapter 20, Section 7, The Consistency of Means and End, Paragraph Number 1. We have said much about discrepancies of means and end and how these must be brought in line before your holy relationship can bring you only joy. But we have also said the means to meet the Holy Spirit's goal will come from the same source as does his purpose. You might want to underline that part about the means to meet the Holy Spirit's goal will come from the same source as does his purpose. So, The means are up to the Holy Spirit. You might ask, well, when do I use this? You can really use this any time you have a relationship that is problematic or troubled. It has challenges. Anything that is really in your way of a peaceful experience, that you can take that relationship and in a quick prayer, you can say, dear God, I take this relationship and I dedicate it to be made holy and purified. And under the Holy Spirit's guidance, will you purify this relationship? Now, before you do that, read The Healed Relationship and A Course in Miracles on one of the books there. It's on page 362. But it says that when you dedicate a relationship to be made holy by the Holy Spirit, that sometimes there's some turbulence that comes up because The means are being aligned to meet your new goal of holiness and peace and happiness and love and all that. So imagine you're on a very large ship and you're headed off in one direction. And if all of a sudden, after years and years, you say, you know what, I think I'd like to go that other way. Well, not only would it take a little bit of time to turn that ship around because there's a lot of momentum behind where it has been going, right? But as it turns, there is turbulence, like the waves are now crashing up against the side of the boat, and it is going to turn, and it is going to go that new direction. I just wanted you to visually see it, that when you dedicate a relationship and give it to God and say, God, would you heal my relationship? Will you show me how to move through this? What do we do? How do we do this? Then don't be alarmed if things get a little crazy at first because the Holy Spirit is now accomplishing the means to meet your goal of holiness. So just keep that in mind and stay the course. The ship is turning and the captain is highly skilled and expert in fact and trust him. Trust him with the means. It may look different, feel different, it may be completely unfamiliar, 
but by the uh, time this relationship gets turned into this purified state, it's all going to make sense. So don't give up your faith on the relationship. Sentence three. Being so simple and direct, this course has nothing in it that is not consistent. The seeming inconsistencies or parts you find more difficult than others are merely indications of areas where means and end are still discrepant. And this produces great discomfort. This need not be. This course requires almost nothing of you. It is impossible to imagine one that asks so little or could offer more. As you look at this, you might think, how do I put this into practice? And I think that's what Terry and I are trying to do is is really think, how do we take this beautiful curriculum and put it to work? You know, where it says the seeming inconsistencies or parts you find more difficult than others are merely indications of areas where means and end are still discrepant. Let's imagine that we have a relationship where one person trusts the other person, but let's say the other person doesn't trust that person, right? So there's kind of an out of alignment trust condition. So when we don't trust someone, they will tend to show up as they are not worthy of our trust you will end up seeing things or hearing things that will make you think, whether it's true or not, that will make you think that they are not acting in a trustworthy kind of way. So as long as we hold that judgment, that person is going to keep playing the role of being untrustworthy. So when we have a judgment, our eyes report the judgment we have made. Your eyes don't show you what that person is doing or what who they really are. It's showing you what you believe to be true in the place of truth. So let's say the person that isn't trusting, they continue to experience this other person as unworthy of their trust. And then the other person, let's say they're fine and they feel that this other person is trustworthy. And so now we've got this inconsistency where the means and end are in discrepancy. So just keep that in mind that the Holy Spirit's function is to actually bring the means in line, and he's going to give you specific guidance about how this can be resolved. So remember that if somebody's showing up and they're not being trustworthy, they're not doing what they say, they're kind of showing up in a failing way in your eyes, that it starts with the belief in our mind And then that person plays a role for us. And now we have this opportunity to either forgive and release them from that role or to revalidate our old belief system and then shoot it out again. And here they come with another untrustworthy kind of experience. So hope that's beginning to make sense. Just know that we can still have out of alignment conditions but it is the Holy Spirit's function to bring everything into line if you'll do the things that he's asking of you, which you are, and then he's going to purify that relationship. Paragraph 2. The period of discomfort that follows the sudden change in a relationship from sin to holiness may now be almost over. To the extent you still experience it, You are refusing to leave the means to him who changed the purpose. You recognize you want the goal. Are you not also willing to accept the means? If you are not, let us admit that you are inconsistent. Let's again try to just bring this to a practical level, and we'll go on with the same example. Let's say you're in relationship with someone. You've been working on being able to trust them and They've been doing pretty good, but maybe there's some things that happened in the past that made you really decide to not trust them. Maybe they were unfaithful or something really bad happened. And so let's say they said, I'll be home tonight at 6 o'clock for dinner, right? And so 6 o'clock comes and goes, 7 o'clock comes and goes, and your partner has not shown up. Now, your temptation to judge them as untrustworthy 
because that's what you know them to be. That's your old judgment of them. Your temptation is going to be very high when it comes about 7.30, right? Where are they? What are they doing? How come they're doing this to me? But you're learning from A Course in Miracles to relinquish judgment and instead to go straight to the Holy Spirit. Now, I would do something like a prayer in that Holy Spirit or dear God, I'm very tempted to judge this person right now. That is my old response. But I don't want my old response, and I don't want my old relationship. I want the purified relationship that you promised me, right? So I'm not going to judge them. I'm just going to give you this situation. It feels like they're late. I'm concerned. I'm going to give you my concern, give you the relationship. I'm going to dedicate this relationship and everything that's going on to the light of truth where peace is inevitable. And I wholly give this to you and ask that you decide for me about all of it because my goal is peace. My goal is the purified, holy relationship, and I am not going to ditch my goal. I'm going to keep my goal. And Holy Spirit, you said your function is to align the means to get to my goal. That's not my job. Now, if I decide it's my job, I might start calling around or I might start going back to what I thought I knew and going back into my lack of trust. So if I take over the means to get to my goal, it's going to slow me down. If we do something like this and we turn it over to the Holy Spirit, especially when we're tempted to judge, that's the sweet spot. Something's going to happen that is going to bless you. It might be right at that point you get a phone call and the person says, I am so sorry I could just now call you, but literally I just, save somebody's life on the freeway. It's on the news right now. In fact, I can wave to you on the TV because I ended up right behind this accident. And here you are thinking they're unfaithful, they're not calling me again. And then maybe you find out that they're out there saving someone's life. And it's not always that dramatic, but it will be corrected in a way that it will feel like a miracle or like a correction has been made. So right when you're in that zone of reclaiming the means and trying to take it over yourself to try to get to the goal that you want, I just want to remind you, the means is up to the Holy Spirit. It's not up to you. So this is a great time to just try to stand down from your judgments and talk yourself off the cliff of judgment and just say, okay, I'm very tempted to judge right now, but I'm learning that that judgment serves me not That's what keeps the pain going. That's what the ego thrives on. It's like gasoline on the fire. It wants you to judge. And if you will judge, your eyes are going to report that your judgment is accurate, right? So we don't want that. We want the healed relationship, which means we stick to the goal and we ask Holy Spirit to handle everything else. And then you will be guided very directly about how to handle it, what to say, how to move forward. If you need to call someone or someone calls you, the Holy Spirit handles all the details. And you can trust that. Sentence six. A purpose is attained by means. And if you want a purpose, you must be willing to want the means as well. How can one be sincere and say, I want this above all else, and yet I do not want to learn the means to get it? It's a good question because I think most of us, we know we want the healing, whatever that is, whether it's uh, financially or in relationship or with our health. We want the healing. We want to know the correction, the healed and happy and abundant state. So we're clear about what we want But where we get a little off track is we think it's up to us to get us there. Or we think it's up to that other person to do what we think they should do to get us there. So the minute we develop our own plan, we get off of God's plan. And it's going to feel like there is delay in this healing. And it doesn't mean you don't do anything. You don't sit in a closet. What it means is that the Holy Spirit is going to be instructing you because you're listening to only his voice. And so he's going to be instructing you, telling you what to do, what to say, how to extend whatever you're thinking and feeling so that it is peaceful 
and that you have a very peaceful and positive outcome. So it's not that you're controlled. I don't want you to think that. It's not that we're little puppets. I've heard people say that before. So all we are is God's puppets, and he tells us what to do. And no, no, no. It's that there's a part of your mind that has never forgotten your perfect self. It's present right now. It is accessible right now. And that part of your mind knows everything about everyone, everywhere. It's a very good resource. That part of your mind you can call on in any moment and ask for help. And that part of your mind will answer. Would you not consult? If you had a person walking around with you that knew everything about everyone all the time, even if you're out driving and you're lost, like wouldn't you ask that person riding with you if they had that bank of information? It's not that they're controlling you. It's that, hey, I'm lost. I need help. And here's this being provided to you that actually can walk you through any difficulty and out the other side. Would you not utilize this great resource? So it's really the highest, wisest part of your mind. At first, it seems like something else other than you because we're not so used to consulting it. We're more used to consulting the ego. But as we consult this one part of our mind, it's going to feel like you are one with it at a certain point, and it won't even feel like there's another voice because that voice will be flowing through you so smoothly and easily. So that's something that happens as we reclaim that relationship and we develop trust and faith and all this happens from practicing in the way he's asking us to. Let's go to paragraph three. To obtain the goal, the Holy Spirit indeed asks little. He asks no more to give the means as well. The means are second to the goal, and when you hesitate, it is because the purpose frightens you and not the means. And he's telling us there that the goal of peace, basically, the goal of the happy outcome can actually frighten us because we're not used to things working. That's kind of a sad state of affairs, but for a lot of people, you're not used to getting what you want or having things work. And sometimes getting what you want can seem scarier than things staying the way that they are because at least what you know about what is happening is familiar. It's not because you don't want happiness because probably everybody does. But let's say that you are doing everything you can just to survive right now, financially or in your relationships, and you just don't have one more ounce of energy to give to something else or something you don't understand. And so you are wholly consumed and preoccupied, just trying to make ends meet, get things done, stay on track, not lose your mind. And so if all of a sudden somebody came to you and said, hey, why don't you try this other route and it's going to be happier, you think, hmm, nah, because (laughs) I just have enough to do. Because we don't really know that that other route will work out. And so your attempts at trying new things, maybe you've done that a a thousand times, and so it could be that there's just not an ounce of you left that feels that you can try something new, and that's okay. But he is telling you that when you do call on God and the Holy Spirit, that you don't need to be afraid by the outcome, that the goal of peace at that point will be accomplished. And the means are going to be provided by the Holy Spirit. All of this is pretty new to a lot of people, right? Because we're all used to kind of fending on our own and figuring things out. And if if we don't do it, it feels like nobody else will. Well, somebody else will. And we can be willing to not be afraid, not let the purpose or the goal of peace frighten us. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the one to assign the means and stay strong on our goal of peace, even if our eyes are showing us things are going crazy out there, stay strong on the goal of peace. And he says that he will accomplish the healing, and he guarantees it. He says, in fact, the Holy Spirit cannot fail, because God gave us the Holy Spirit for this purpose, 
it is his function to help us meet that goal. Sentence five. Remember this, for otherwise you will make the error of believing the means are difficult. Yet how can they be difficult if they are merely given you? They guarantee the goal, and they are perfectly in line with it. Before we look at them a little closer, remember that if you think they are impossible, your wanting of the purpose has been shaken. For if a goal is possible to reach, the means to do so must be possible as well. Let's say that you've been working at something, some problem, for 20 years, and you're exhausted. There's just nothing left in you to try to get it accomplished, whatever it is. And it can be very easy to lose hope and give up and think that there is no answer. And I caution you about that because in A Course in Miracles, it says that when you decide there is no answer, there is no solution, it's too complicated to solve, the Holy Spirit actually has to stand down on the healing until you change your mind. He cannot override you. So even if it's an, a terminal illness that you're dealing with and waiting for the days to go by and you don't know what's happening there but it doesn't look good or a relationship or a financial situation, do not decide there is no answer. Do not decide it is too complicated. If you must, go back to that first line of A Course in Miracles and say, there is no order of difficulty in miracles and paste that on your refrigerator. With God, all things are possible. All of it. And we have to be willing to know it can be solved. If you are having trouble with that, I like to remind you that maybe for those 20 years when it didn't work, it was probably because you did not involve God and the Holy Spirit at the level that you are today. That's okay. But now that you are, the results are going to be different, clearly different. So be willing to make room for that in your mind. And if your mind, your ego is telling you, this can't be solved, that person will never change, this is too far gone, you just say, that's what I do. I do that with my ego, <laughs> and especially in the middle of the night when it's trying to share a message. <laughs> and then I just say, God, you have my attention. Your voice is the only voice I would choose to listen to. And I am going to know that this healing is not only possible, but I expect it because your will is done. The fact that I'm seeing this relationship or this situation as unhealed, that's a lie. And I don't know how to see it otherwise, but what I do know is that what you created as perfect cannot be made imperfect. And so I'm just going to hold on to what I know is true about you, borrow your certainty, call on your wisdom, your clarity, and the healing through the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to give it up. And that's a really good way to go, to invite the healing which many times can look like a miracle. Paragraph 4. It is impossible to see your brother as sinless and yet to look upon him as a body. Let's stop right there because I think sometimes we get it in our mind that, okay, I can see this person over there and I'm just going to imagine them sinless or perfect or pure light. I'm going to see this body, this person, as acting perfectly. That's not it. We have to understand that they are not a body. That body over there is not much different than the body you experience in your nighttime dreams. We're not here to perfect bodies. We are here to remember that the holy child of God is not a body. So we have to understand that what we're looking at is the projection of this person. It is the false image that we have decided that we are using to replace the truth in our mind. You don't have to choose to see them as the truth of all that they are because we have, quite frankly, forgotten what that is. 
but it is very important that you acknowledge in your mind that the body is not the truth of them. Their behavior, their personalities, their flaws, their addictions, this is not the truth of them. God did not create those conditions. That's what I use to remind myself. This is not of God. God did not create these conditions. God did not create his children to be addicted or mean or evil or dark or corrupted. God did not create his children to be less than perfect. So if I'm looking at someone or something that is less than perfect, I am looking at my own projection. It's just important that we understand the difference because of the one that we are inviting into our mind. He cannot take it over. He cannot lay his thoughts over yours. He has to be wholly invited. So if the Holy Spirit is going to enter your mind and shine the light of truth, he has to know that you're done with the lie, that you have no interest in the projection, not the person. Of course, we love our people and all that. Love is real. But we must understand in our mind that they are not a body. We're not looking at the truth in order for the Holy Spirit to begin to unveil what is true. You can think of it as the Holy Spirit's knocking at the door. And the way that you open a door to him is you choose to recognize the truth in someone instead of the lie, which is that they are a limited body born to die and to be difficult and imperfect and to be a stressor in your life. This is the projection of them. And then as you hold on to what is real and true, then the Holy Spirit has full permission to enter your thoughts because you're no longer out of alignment with him. And now when he's coming to help you, he's doing this without your hesitation, without your resistance. And so now your thoughts get healed. And just like a dream at night, if you have healed thoughts, you're very likely to have a very loving, sweet, happy dream. So when your thoughts are guided by the Holy Spirit at your invitation, without resistance and without your fixation on illusions, you're very likely to have the happy dream. And in the happy dream, those other people, they show up in a lovely way and it will blow your mind. And when you see that happen the first time or two, it's startling. I've had many people practice this and all of a sudden, That person that was a persecutor or an adversary, like all of a sudden they're showing up and asking how they can help or what they can do or giving you a compliment and you could fall over with a feather. Well, number one is it is impossible to see your brother as sinless and yet to look upon him as a body. So the challenge is every single person out there, you've got to practice understanding that they are not bodies. There's more to them than that. And ask for it, expect an answer, and remind yourself you're not looking at the truth. This is what allows the Holy Spirit to intervene on your behalf and bring the means to meet your goal of peace, happiness, and a great outcome. Sentence number two. Is this not perfectly consistent with the goal of holiness? For holiness is merely the result of letting the effects of sin be lifted. So what was always true is recognized. To see a sinless body is impossible. For holiness is positive and the body is merely neutral. It is not sinful, but neither is it sinless. As nothing, which it is, the body cannot meaningfully be invested with attributes of Christ or of the ego. Either must be an error, for both would place the attributes where they cannot be, and both must be undone for purposes of truth. I thought that was really interesting that he says that the body is neutral. It's not sinful. It's not sinless. It's nothing. It's a projection. It's not any different than the bodies you might see in your dreams at night. They're nothing. They are figures playing a role representing some of your thoughts. That's what they are. That's what I'm doing with you right now. I am playing a role. Terry is playing a role. 
sharing with you some thoughts of things that apparently you would like to learn more about. And so here we are sharing those things with you. We're playing roles with you. In this case, ideally, it's a happy role, one that we all enjoy. So that's our goal, too, is that we would play very happy roles for you. So being aware that you can't spend time trying to see the body as sinless or even as sinful, it's a waste of time. The body is neutral. It is the effect of the mind. It is nothing because God didn't create it. What God created is eternal, whole, complete, blessed, pure light, perfect in creation. We may not know what that looks like. It's something maybe we don't remember. But the minute you start calling it out, you're calling for what is real and true and yours. And so the Holy Spirit will automatically respond to that. And the way that we really allow the Holy Spirit to enter is when we choose to see the light and the perfection of each and every person instead of the body. Not within the body or about the body. It has nothing to do with the body. It's just when we are tempted to judge that body over there, we can remind ourselves, wait a minute, they're not even a body. Like this is so not true and it's not representative of what is real because what God created is not this. I want the truth instead of this. Now we're right back in alignment with the Holy Spirit. Let's go now to paragraph 5. The body is the means by which the ego tries to make the unholy relationship seem real. You might want to write the word weapon out in your margin that the body is the means by which who? The ego tries to make the unholy relationship seem real. So your ego, my ego, Terry's ego, all the time, 24-7, is trying to use these bodies to convince us that sin is real, evil is real, darkness is real, which means God is not, love is not, holiness is not. So remember, it's an either-or kind of thing. When you declare illusions are real, you are forfeiting your awareness of the truth. When you declare the truth is real, the illusion will have no consequence. You will not even be aware of it at the time. So you have to choose one. And if you choose illusions, it's going to feel as though the truth has left your mind. And then the effect of that is you will feel like your abundance left, your happiness left. All the good things come from God. The ego represents the opposite of what is real and true. And what God created is pure and perfect and of love and happiness and joy. So if you try to imagine the opposite of that, that's what the ego represents. If you listen to the ego, that's what you end up with is this projection of the absence of love, the absence of light, the absence of joy. And you know we feel it when that happens. So it will feel like you are powerless and without the answer. Let's go to sentence two. The unholy instant is the time of bodies, but the purpose here is sin. It cannot be attained but in illusion. And so the illusion of a brother as a body is quite in keeping with the purpose of unholiness. Because of this consistency, the means remain unquestioned while the end is cherished. Again, putting it back in practice where the unholy instant is the time of bodies, but the purpose is sin. Let's say you watch the news and you see that a 100 people in a crime ring were arrested and maybe they were doing really bad things with little people that we love so much. And you'd be really tempted as you watch that news to just really reaffirm that judgment and that darkness is real. And yeah, it's great that they got arrested and it will stop, but it's very tempting to let yourself revalidate that darkness is real, evil is real, corruption is real, or abuse is real. It's not that we're staring at the TV and we're trying to go la, 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 that kind of thing. It's that when you're looking at a news story like that, you have to know that, first of all, it's coming from the ego. 
The ego wants your attention, wants you to validate that evil and darkness are real. So if we think about our goal, our goal is not evil and darkness. If we listen and revalidate our old belief system, then we're going to end up on the island of evil and darkness in our mind in terms of we're going to see the same things happen again and again. But remember that our goal is peace. Our goal is happiness. Our goal is a world where our children are safe, right? Don't lose sight of your goal. Your goal is the goal. The Holy Spirit is the one to accomplish the means to get you to the goal. So when you watch that news story, what I do is I'll look at it and I'll pause because I know right away my temptation would be to be highly disturbed by what I just heard, even though I'm feeling good and glad that they are being stopped. But that's not enough in consciousness because if we just let that story roll through our mind without understanding what it's representing, we're very likely to see another story and another story and sometimes the children don't get saved, right? So if you want these children saved, we can pause right in front of the news story and we can take it to God. And we can say, God, this story, it truly troubles me. This is not what I want. This is not your will, and it's not mine. I'm going to give this to you, this whole story, and I choose that it would stop now. It is not my will. I choose to see every one of these people. I'm going to just lay down their bodies in my mind. I choose to acknowledge the perfection in them that you created, that you did not create them to act out in this way. That's my projection at work. I am going to hold on to the light of your perfect creation within them. And I may not even know how to do that, but you have taught me that I must choose to see the light of the Holy Spirit in every single person in order for it to be shown to me. Now, you might think, well, why do I want to do that? These people did all these crazy, creepy, horrible things. If you want the children to be safe in our world, this is the way that I have found that we can stand up to the darkness and the evil. What we have to do is bring it all to the light. We have to keep our goal of the light. We have to ask the Holy Spirit to heal our mind of any thought we have that God's children could do such horrible, terrible things. And that we say, Holy Spirit, you decide about what these people can do. You decide about what happens to our precious children. I am going to stand down on my judgment, and I am going to hold on to the light of truth in every single person, including these children, and I bring this to you, and I ask you to take it over. And I am going to stay focused on what you created in each one of us. Now, when you do this, You're allowing the Holy Spirit to enter your mind. This is all in your prayer work. This is not something you have to go out shouting on the street. It's just about work and consciousness because your ego is showing you a picture, like a hand in front of your face, and it's saying, is this real? Is this true? And if you say yes, because you're obviously very distraught by what you see, then the ego goes, great, let me bring you some more because I'm going to use anything that works with you. But if the ego puts it in front of your face and you look at it and you say, well, God did not create his children to do such things. And so I'm going to take this to God. I'm going to question what I see in consciousness and I'm going to take it to God and ask for the truth instead of this. The benefit is that the Holy Spirit can now enter your mind, heal your thoughts that are producing the darkened illusion, and then you're going to have a different experience. You might just see children being rescued all over the place, or you might see children having a very safe environment and circumstances where they cannot be hurt, things like that. So if we want to see a world that we long to behold, we must first choose to see it in our mind and call on the Holy Spirit to bring us the means to get us there, and he will. So I hope that made sense. I know it's a lot to take in. And I'm not saying by any means that these people that do the terrible things shouldn't be arrested and all that. That's what's happening in the world, the illusion as we know it. It is part of the healing process, and I'm glad for it. I'm always glad when 
some kind of maliciousness stops, the abuse stops, I'm elated. But I know that my work is not done. I have to go back to the truth, and I have to keep my mind on the goal because the Holy Spirit can't serve up the means to get me to my goal if I lose sight of my own goal. Let's go now to sentence six. Seeing adapts to wish, for sight is always secondary to desire. And if you see the body, you have chosen judgment and not vision. For vision, like relationships, has no order. You either see or not. I thought sentence number six was one of the most profound sentences I have read in a while. Seeing adapts to wish for sight is always secondary to desire so when you see a story of say children being hurt which is horrific and horrible he's saying by the time you see it it is adapting to your beliefs if you have a belief that darkness is real evil is real well then your seeing is going to show you these people showing up that are going to play out the role of darkness and evil, even if they're being carted off to jail. But just being aware that your seeing adapts to your wish, meaning what you're choosing to invest in your mind or invest your mind into. And then it says, for sight is always secondary to desire. And again, it doesn't mean you wake up in the morning and you desire for something bad to happen to children. Of course not. But say that you have a choice. You will either choose to listen to the teacher of peace, the Holy Spirit, or you're choosing to listen to the teacher of pain, being the ego. And the one you listen to will determine the outcome of what you are witnessing. So you may not want to listen to the teacher of pain, but if you are, then it can only be through desire. Because you are always at choice. It doesn't mean you find it to be fun. It doesn't mean that you look forward to it. It means that for whatever reason, the voice of the ego and the teacher of pain is where your attention is. And until you change your mind to put it back on the Holy Spirit, then you are there by your own desire. I hope that makes sense. It's not like you wish for bad things to happen. It's that... You're witnessing bad things happening because you're choosing through your own desire to focus on that which produces darkened experiences. And you're not flawed and you're not a bad person, nothing like that. It's that we're so used to listening to our ego that it's actually a new experience sometimes to really focus on the voice of the teacher of peace and the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves a hundred times a day to do it again. Get back over there. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And also you're walking through illusions 24-7, so it's not unusual that those images would get your attention frequently. So it's quite a little balancing thing that we do. But keep in mind that the rewards are great, and the rewards include the safety of everyone as part of the healing. So there are great rewards with this practice. So stay the course. It's prayer work. It's work in consciousness. And you will see the effects of your prayers. Let's go to paragraph six. Who sees a brother's body has laid a judgment on him and sees him not. He does not really see him as sinful. He does not see him at all. As we look at other people, of course, it's very tempting to believe, well, they are a body. Look at, there he is right over there. But I try to remind myself that I really am walking around in my dream and that the people I see, the figures I see, and even Terry, that he's this wonderful figure in my dream that plays this role of unconditional love and happiness and support and How cool is that? In my dream, I have this playmate, this figure in my dream that we have such a good time together. Now, if I look out in my dream and I see these figures that are not playing such happy, loving roles, I have some work to do because it means that I still have some beliefs 
where I am entertaining what God did not create, you see? So it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It means that I have some thoughts in my mind that still need some healing. So when I see these people acting out in a way that I don't like, and I do see it still, and you do too, like when I see these things, I pause as much as I can remember, and I choose again. I say, behold the Holy Son of God, no matter how dark or evil that person looks over there, behold the Holy Son of God. They are not what I have made of them. They are not the image that I have placed in front of the truth. That darkness and evil and corruption and sin, this is not the will of God and it is not my will. Holy Spirit, heal my mind. Take it over and allow my eyes to report what you would have me see. And it's amazing when you go through the day and you don't have to have those exact words. Use your own words. But what I'm doing is I am questioning the illusion and I am calling on the truth. And when you do this, you're going to find that your life heals in rapid fire it's amazing so it's kind of fun to practice and it is really just a practice but the holy spirit cannot give you what you are unwilling to have the holy spirit cannot enter where he is not welcome and the only way he can intervene is when you are in alignment with what he's bringing to you you see so the choice has to be made before your eyes will behold it Sentence number three. In the darkness of sin, he is invisible. He can but be imagined in the darkness, and it is here that the illusions you hold about him are not held up to his reality. Here are illusions and reality kept separated. Here are illusions never brought to truth and always hidden from it. And here, in darkness, is your brother's reality imagined as a body in unholy relationships with other bodies, serving the cause of sin an instant before he dies? I would just add that the Holy Spirit does not need us to fix things. He needs us to understand that they are not real because God did not create them. Once we are willing to welcome that into our mind that we are still in the dream state, we are still projecting based on our belief system, then the Holy Spirit can intervene and heal our thoughts. So we're not in the fixing business. We are in the questioning business. So when you look at something that is coming from your own mind projected outward and you don't like what you see, question it. And go to the truth. Take it to God and say, God, you decide about this because it's troubling me greatly and I don't know what to do with this and I want happiness instead of this. I want joy instead of this. I want a safe and loving world instead of this. And Holy Spirit, you decide for me and it is done. Let's go to paragraph 7. There is indeed a difference between this vain imagining and vision The difference lies not in them, but in their purpose. Both are but means, each one appropriate to the end for which it is employed. Neither can serve the purpose of the other, for each one is a choice of purpose, employed on its behalf. Either is meaningless without the end for which it was intended, nor is it valued as a separate thing apart from the intention. The means seem real because the goal is valued, and judgment has no value unless the goal is sin. I'll give a quick example on a little lighter topic. I know the last one was pretty tough, but we do all seem to face tough topics, but this one's lighter. I used it earlier in the series, but I'll bring it back here. It's quick. I know I went through a period of time where I just kept seeing people very unsupportive of each other. I always found like people were, well, not always, but after studying A Course in Miracles, people would start to be very supportive of me, very loving, very kind, holding doors open. You would think I was royalty wherever I go. Sometimes I have two people opening the doors at the same time. You start to feel kind of funny because people are just 
start being so good and kind to you wherever you go. But I was noticing I was still seeing a world around me where people were not kind to each other. They weren't looking out for each other, and it still troubled me. Maybe I'd see them arguing, or I would see somebody walking through a door and closing the door in somebody else's face when they're maybe like a foot behind them, or and then they might lose their drink. It was just this sleepful, lack of awareness situation. And so I was excited for seeing my personal experience healing, but I didn't feel like I was seeing it externally. And so I went to work. I started doing my work in consciousness. And so let's say I see somebody walk through a door and they let the door slam in the face of the person behind them and and the person loses their drink. And I think, oh, so I'm very tempted to say, wow, people are really asleep and they're not really paying attention and they're not looking out for one another. And so I could easily go into my belief system and I could revalidate that judgment against people around me all over again. You see how easy that would be. But instead, I would pause because I know that is not the way to a healed and loving world, right? So I would just pause, and maybe I'm getting ready to get out of my car to go through those same doors. I would pause, and I would say, God, you did not create your children to be rude or careless or selfish or completely unaware of what's happening around them. This is not your will. This is the projection I have made. I forgive myself, but I want the truth instead of this. Only love is real. So if I'm seeing this situation where love is not being expressed, I'm looking at an illusion. And Holy Spirit, I want the truth instead of this. So I might do that right in my car before I get out the door. And so it's interesting because I had to do that a few times before I saw the benefit and because it was a very fixed belief that I had, to tell you the truth, that people were not really looking out for each other. And I think I had been committed to that idea for quite a long time. But I did it a few times. I would see it here, see it there, and I would be tempted to, I call it squirting ketchup, which means to revalidate my judgment all over again. And each time I would pause and pray and do my prayer homework and then the ego would up the ante and then it would be something a little more awful looking in front of me and then I would pause and pray and do my work in consciousness and then all of a sudden Terry and I went to a parade in our little town and it was all a standing on the sidewalk kind of parade but there was a big brick wall and Terry and I we hopped up on top of the wall it was pretty high and we were able to get up on top of this wall so we could see, and that was great. And there was just all these people around, and all of a sudden, part of the crowd, there was a tall gentleman, and he had this little older lady on his arm, and it looked like his grandmother. We didn't really know. So she could kind of barely walk, and I'm already watching her like, wow, she's at a parade. I'm already looking around. Is there a way we can find her a chair or something like that? And Terry and I were even talking about, is there any way we could sit her up on the wall? So we're just kind of beginning to notice that she's going to need something because she could tell she was struggling with standing. Then all of a sudden, the crowd parts, and this guy comes running up with this chair. And you could tell that the two people didn't know him, and he lays the chair out. He says, please let her sit here. And the grandson or whoever he was, he said, really? And he said, yes, yes, this is for her. Everybody's just looking around like, where did this guy come from with a chair? It looked like he couldn't even see her situation. He was way back in the crowd. So I just smiled and I said, thank you, God. There's my world, my loving, happy, wonderful world where people go out of their way to help each other. Thank you, thank you. And I could feel that God was showing me the effect of my own prayer homework. So it's not about getting a great illusion, but it's not bad either. It's nice to see the good illusion, but it's showing you that your mind is healing. And since that time, it seems like God gives me a front row seat to any kind thing that somebody is doing for someone else. I see it all the time now. Like before, I used to never see it. It was just constantly people looking out for themselves and no one else. It was like planet in a silo. But 
now I just see love everywhere. I see people go out of their way to help one another. But it took me a few times of standing up to my own disbelief, my own belief in what is not true, what is not so, what is not there, what has no power, and what is not to be feared. So I took it to God, good choice, and then the Holy Spirit is the one to align the means to meet my goal. What was my goal? A loving, happy world where people look out for each other. And then the Holy Spirit cleaned all that up for me and now tends to put me in a front row seat. Every time somebody does something really sweet for someone else, I get to watch. So lucky me. And hopefully you'll join me there and we can watch together. Paragraph number eight. The body cannot be looked upon except through judgment. The body cannot be looked upon except through judgment. So when we see another person as a body, we're already judging. Do you see that? Oof, that's like a, you have to catch yourself. It's okay. We see all these bodies around us, but practice every day. Thank you, God, that you did not create bodies. You created us as eternal spirit, invulnerable, that you created us to be happy and to know your love in everything we do. We are not a body. We are one with God, eternal forever. Thank you, God, that what is real is real and what is true is true. And as you do your homework and you stay focused on your goal of the truth, the Holy Spirit will be busy aligning the means to show you that your goal has been accomplished. Sentence two. To see the body is the sign that you lack vision and have denied the means the Holy Spirit offers you to serve his purpose. Every time we see a body, we can remind ourselves, hmm, if I'm seeing this body, it means I'm already lacking spiritual vision. It doesn't mean we're deficient. It means we're not aware of it at the time. So if we're not aware of it at the time, it means we can be aware of it. You could say to God, God, I'm seeing all these bodies here, and you're telling me that when I see bodies, it means I'm lacking vision. Well, I want my full and total vision according to your will. So I'm here to declare that bodies are not your will, that you created us as eternal spirit, one with you, and I want the full benefit of my vision. Holy Spirit, will you please give me the vision to see, your vision to see. And so when we do this, we're making room in our mind for illumination. And you will have it. Sentence three. How can a holy relationship achieve its purpose through the means of sin? Judgment, you taught yourself. Vision is learned from him who would undo your teaching. Keep in mind that vision is learned from the Holy Spirit who would undo what you've been taught or taught yourself. So we're going to get this vision through our relinquishment of judgment. We have to let go of the judgments so he has room to heal our mind. Number five. His vision cannot see the body because it cannot look on sin, and thus it leads you to reality. You know, if Christ was standing in front of you, it's telling us that he cannot see your body. He sees you as you are. And maybe what he sees is this beautiful being of perfect light and love and joy. I think even when Jesus was with those that had leprosy, that he didn't see them as bodies with leprosy. That's my guess, that what he saw was the truth of them. He saw them as the holy, perfect, precious children of God, eternal spirit. And he was so certain about what he saw, they joined him there. And then the healing was accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Imagine that if a dreamer has a dream, and now they either don't want that dream anymore or they move on to something else, what happens to the dream? Well, it's undone. I mean, on the spot, it's undone. If right now I ask you to think about a purple giraffe, 
you might be able to see that purple giraffe in your mind. But when you move on to something, what happened to your purple giraffe? Well, he's gone. So what I love thinking about is that when we call in the vision of the Holy Spirit, then whatever we were holding in our mind in the form of illusion, it can be undone instantly because it wasn't true or real in the first place. And if we will let that into our mind instead of holding on to it as, no, that's reality, which means the truth is not, when we hold in our mind that illusions are not real, they have no effects of their own, and we will not assign effects to what has no effects, we have no interest in our illusions being real, we want the truth instead of this. And when the majority of our mind is leaning in the direction of the truth, what happens to the illusion? It's undone. Now you and I, we're still asleep and dreaming, so we don't instantly awaken until we are ready, as made ready by the Holy Spirit. So now we're still asleep and dreaming, but what happens? We have disengaged from the darkened dream. We have placed our attention on the Holy Spirit, and so that darkened dream is undone. Did you hear that? Just like that. (laughs) The darkened dream is undone, and it will be undone as quickly as our mind will allow it to be undone. If our mind says, oh, no, no, that's going to take time. Oh, no, no, it's too big. Oh, no, no, I've been working on this for too many years. It's going to take at least six months. Oh, no, no, the doctor says it's going to be nine months for this to heal. So if our mind assigns a value to the time the healing takes, do you know that you get to be right until you change your mind. So remind yourself that whatever it is you would love to see in the healed state, that it takes no time. It's the undoing of an illusion. It's not reality being reprogrammed to be a better situation. It's the undoing of a projection, which means it can be like that. Let's go to sentence number seven. Your holy brother, sight of whom is your release, is no illusion. Attempt to see him not in darkness, for your imaginings about him will seem real there. You closed your eyes to shut him out. Such was your purpose. And while this purpose seems to have a meaning, the means for its attainment will be evaluated as worth the seeing, and so you will not see. There's this example that the Holy Spirit, I feel like he gave me quite a while back. It's kind of a simple example, but it does help. If you imagine right now, let's say you have a thousand thoughts in your mind. Actually, there's so many more, but a thousand thoughts in your mind, and every single thought, let's say, represents a bubble. And you've got light-filled, clear, happy bubbles, and then you've got these darkened bubbles. And the darkened bubbles are the thoughts you're holding against yourself, against other people, darkened thoughts are thoughts that are not in alignment with what is true. They are not of love. They are not of truth or sinlessness or joy or happiness. So let's say 30% of your thought bubbles are still dark and mine too, right? Because we have these thoughts where we are validating what is not real, what is not true, what never occurred in truth. So we've got these darkened bubbles. And what happens is that these little bubbles in our mind, they are actually going to project in the dream. And now instead of a thousand bubbles, I'm going to have a thousand people, let's say, show up. And two-thirds of them are lovely, wonderful people. And my little darkened bubbles are going to have little darkened figures show up in my dream. And I'm going to be able to look at my thoughts turned outward in these people, right? Now, if I see the darkened bubble person over there that's showing me darkness, evil, corruption, meanness, addiction, all the things that God is not, that if I validate that as real and true, well, then the darkened bubble in my mind will stay. But I have this wonderful opportunity to look at that person that's playing the role, acting out my own darkened bubble the one that is blocking me from complete and total freedom, if I will look at that person and say, hey, that person over there is playing a role 
to mirror some beliefs I have. I wonder what beliefs they are playing for me. Maybe they're playing the belief that people are evil. Maybe they're playing the belief that I'm not loved. Maybe they're playing a belief that I'm not supported. Maybe they're playing a belief that I must be holding on to that says I'm not a good mother or that I'm not a good sister or daughter. So whoever that person over there, whatever script they're playing out, of course, the miracle says we put the script in their hand. We don't realize it, but we did. And now they're acting out a role. They're representing my little darkened bubble in my mind, the one that's not based on the truth. And my perfect healing opportunity has arrived. Because if I can look at them and go, wait a minute, God did not create people to do such things. God did not create this person to be unsupportive, unloving, addicted, or a detriment in my life. I must be looking at one of my darkened bubble thoughts, right, turned outward. And you wouldn't say it to them, of course. This is all done in, in your homework time. So we're looking out at them and we're saying, this person is acting out some old, unhealed beliefs I still have. A Course in Miracles says you must own that you are the dreamer of your dream and you are looking at the story you made up. So this person, in order for them to act out in this way, they are showing me my unhealed belief. And I have a perfect opportunity. I have one of two choices, basically. I can revalidate my darkened bubble thought and say, well, this person, they're terrible, and look, they don't love me, and they don't do this, and they're not enough, and they said the wrong thing. And if I revalidate it, my darkened bubble thought stays in my mind. And bonus, your ego goes, oh, that works. Let me bring you another person just like that, maybe 10. If you pause instead and you look over at that person that's acting out that darkened bubble thought, you go, wait a minute. God did not create his children to act out in such ways. He created perfectly. He created innocence, perfection, beauty, blessing, completion, everything good. And only what God created is real, and he created everything. And that means everything that's not real, not true, and doesn't represent the light of perfect love, is not real. So I look at this person acting out in this way and I have to say that must be my projection because God did not create this condition. I am looking at what appears to be imperfect and God did not create imperfection. And so I'm going to question what I see. And that's enough for the Holy Spirit to enter your mind and begin to heal that darkened bubble for you. The healing occurs for you from the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit cannot take that darkened bubble out of your mind unless you are done with it. And the way you know you're done with it is you have to choose to see the light and perfect self of that other person, not a perfect body. We know about that. We choose to see the light of Christ, the light of the Holy Spirit, perfect creation within them. And what I tell myself is it's not that. Whatever I'm looking at that I think is flawed or a failure, it's not that. Behold the Holy Son of God. Dear God, give me the vision to see this person truly as you created them. When I do that, I'm now making room for my little darkened bubbles to be healed. When my darkened bubbles are healed in my mind, I am now going to be aware of who I am. And he says the only way to remember your true self is through other people. It's by extending what is real about you to the reality of them. And when you do this, it's an automatic invitation to the Holy Spirit to accomplish the healing for you. That is his function. Paragraph 9. Your question should not be, How can I see my brother without the body? Ask only, do I really wish to see him sinless? That's really interesting, too. So he's saying, don't ask, how can I see these other people without their bodies? Because 
that would almost feel impossible because there they are, bodies looking right back at you. He said, instead, ask, do I really wish to see them sinless? And hopefully the answer is yes. And if you do wish to see them sinless, no matter how they are represented to you, the Holy Spirit is the one to make that happen and to bring you the means. So don't try to just will, they're not a body, they're not a body, they're not a body. You're like you're, you're kind of having a standoff with your own mind. We got to, I call it inviting the big guns. We got to invite Holy Spirit to do what he came to do. It's his function to heal our mind and show us true and perfect total vision. So if we ask, God, I choose to see this person as sinless, even though, look at what they just did. Look what I saw in the news. Look what I saw happening in my living room, right? So even though I'm seeing this sin, I choose to see them as sinless. Show me how. And now the door is open again. Let's go to number three to the end. And as you ask, forget not that his sinlessness is your escape from fear. Salvation is the Holy Spirit's goal. The means is vision. For what the seeing look upon is sinless. No one who loves can judge, and what he sees is free of condemnation. And what he sees he did not make, for it was given him to see, as was the vision that made his seeing possible. I love those words. What he sees is free of condemnation. So just imagine when somebody is acting out one of your darkened bubble thoughts, we must free them from condemnation in our mind. It's an act of consciousness. And when we do this, this is where the Holy Spirit can really get in and accomplish the healing of our mind. And then our eyes, remember the seeing follows desire, the seeing uh, follows the adaptation to our wishes. And so when we take our wishes to see illusions and we bring it on over to turn it into a wish to know only the truth, then the Holy Spirit can accomplish his function without our interference <laughs> so and without delay. Terry, why don't you close us out here tonight with one of your Q&As? Okay. Well, my question for today is, how much planning do I need to do for my personal needs and supplies? And the answer is found in text, chapter 13, section 7, sentence 10.1. Only the Holy Spirit knows what you need, for he will give you all things that do not block the way to light. Your Father knoweth that you have need of nothing. In heaven this is so, for what could you need in eternity? In your world you do need things. It is a world of scarcity in which you find yourself because you are lacking. Yet can you find yourself in such a world? Without the Holy Spirit, the answer would be no. Yet because of him, the answer is a joyous yes. As mediator between the two worlds, he knows what you have need of and what will not hurt you. Only the Holy Spirit knows what you need for he will give you all things that do not block the way to light. I think that sentence, and I know you started with that and ended with that, I think it's so important to memorize, at least the first part. Only the Holy Spirit knows what I need. Only the Holy Spirit knows what I need. And let's say you're in a situation where you think you need many things. You think you need money. You think you need to pay something. You think you need to heal a certain relationship, you think you need to go to work, you think all kinds of things, but remind yourself, especially in those areas where you think that something is needed that's not there, where there seems to be scarcity, and one way you can disengage from that teacher of pain being the ego is just remind yourself, well, ego, you're telling me that I need all these things that I don't have, which would be very problematic, right? But I'm reminding myself that only the Holy Spirit knows what I need. And he will give me all things that do not block the way to light. 
isn't that great that the one who knows what we need is looking out for us and will make sure that we have only those things that don't block the way to light. So it's one way that's very quick to disengage from the ego and its long list of demands and what you didn't do and what you don't have and what's not going on. Only the Holy Spirit knows what I need. So I can rest and I can allow him to guide me. I can allow this divine wisdom to flow through me. Only the Holy Spirit knows what I need. I don't know what I need. And what I do need will be provided. And I can be assured it will not block my way to the light. Dear God, we thank you for this time together. It's been such a pleasure. And I know some of these topics are tough, but I like to hit the tough topics. And so hopefully everyone here was able to hear some of those examples and try to understand the context of the message. We are learning that what we see in the world in the form of darkness or evil or corruption or pain or attack or war, all of these things, this is not your will. And we choose only your will be done. And when we see these things, we're learning to question them. We're learning to say no. That's my projection. That's not the truth as God created it. And we don't really know what the truth is. We just know it's not that. And that's enough. That's enough for the Holy Spirit to enter, to intervene, to heal our mind, and to accomplish the healing on our behalf. And then our eyes will report the healing. So we thank you, God, for a very rapid healing of our mind that we would know the greatness of God's love in everything that we do in the quickest possible way. We give you a hearty invitation, and we welcome you always. And if we forget, we ask that you would remind us so that we never forget to make room for you. We want the peace of God together. We choose it. We expect it. We know it is ours. It is our right. And God gave it to us and all glory to our creator that what has been given is still ours. The blessing is ours, and it cannot and can never be taken away. Thank you, God, that what you have given is perfect, whole, total, and complete. And tonight we will celebrate that what you have given us is perfect, and we will let the rest go and allow the Holy Spirit to heal our mind of any thought that we have ever lost or been deprived of what God has given us. Please heal that part of our mind and thank you that all of our children all across the world that they are safe they are loved they are provided for they are blessed because they are the children of God just as we are we see them in the light of God's perfect love and protection and we have no tolerance for anything less than what God has given us And in terms of darkness, evil, corruption, or abuse, Holy Spirit, decide for us. Let it be undone. We command it that it be undone in the name of the light of our Father in heaven. We command that it be undone. We have no use for it. We choose to see all the children of this world in the light that God has created them. They are not a body. They cannot suffer. They cannot sacrifice. They cannot be less than whole. Thank you, God, for healing our mind, that our eyes will report to us this healing, and we will know the greatness of God's love in everything we do, every breath we take. Thy will be done. Amen.